Today we're going to look at the UK's external position, which is another word for the current account. I'm going to try and understand what's been happening to the external position uh, in the last 30 or 40 years and see if we can uh, ask ourselves whether it's a cause for concern. It's something we may hear people talking about uh, in the next few weeks as we enter yet another election campaign and there'll be all kinds of uh, comments made by politicians on one side or the other. But what I've tried to do in these lectures, and those of you who come along, is I've tried to look at the facts, try to confront them with some theories, and see if at the end we can uh, draw some comfort, or indeed ask ourselves what we should be concerned about when we think about these things. And one of the things we think about when we think about the current account is, is that, you go back a very long way, probably and arguably since the Renaissance, and up till at least Adam Smith was publishing The Wealth of Nations, and David Ricardo, not very far away from here, was developing his ideas of trade theory, um, the dominant bit of economic thought was mercantilism. And this was some idea that what mattered was exporting more than you imported. So you had a surplus on trade with the rest of the world. And the reason you wanted a surplus on trade with the rest of the world was so that you could collect bits of shiny metal known as gold in return for that, that surplus on trade with the rest of the world. And if you collected gold, you were rich, and you had little bits of shiny gold that you could use at some point in the future and, and exercise your wealth over. And this was a, a dominant um, part of economic thought. And it's only relatively recently we've realised, and I'm going to argue in this lecture, it doesn't particularly matter whether you have a surplus or a, a deficit. I hope that's not too astounding a thought. Because, of course, we're associated, and we have in our minds all kinds of connections with surpluses. Surpluses are good. Um, we all have you know, memories of, of cold winters or cold springs or even cold summers. And it's important to store food. It's important to have a surplus in that sense. Um, surpluses are good. They're associated with times of plenty. So I think in our, the value system we adopt in language, surpluses are things that are thought to be things that we would desire. Whereas deficits are bad. Deficits are awful. Things that you should avoid at all costs. Um, they, they stir up all notions of bad things, things that we should not have. Um, if I'm in um, deficit, I owe someone else something. If I'm in deficit, I lose my independence. I, someone is going to tell me to do things for them if I owe them something. So as a result, I think some of this language continues even to this day. Um, and I think that's what we want to see if we... We're going to expose it some of the data and see if we still believe that current account deficits are bad and current account surpluses are good. But before doing that, one of the great joys of giving these lectures is for me to go back and read things that I, I read um, many years ago and read them again with fresh eyes and uh, see what they're telling me. Of course, I didn't read this in real time uh, when uh, I was there. Yeah, right. but, but this is a quote from a wonderful book uh, published in the interwar period by Jacob Viner on studies in the theory of international trade. It was a book that I read um, as a, a young postgraduate, uh, not, a, not very far away from here at the London School of Economics. And Richard Lester, um, I'm not sure, you know, I, 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 with a name like that, I'm probably related to royalty in some way or other, we can imagine, um, as a Yorkist of some sort. But what he's arguing here is that first, as to this, that no gold or silver comes into England, but that which is in England is carried by, uh, beyond the sea. So what he's arguing is, I maintain that it is because the land spends too much on merchandise, this sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's also something we've been doing in this country for too long. In, as in grocery, as in mercery, and peltry, fur coats, for example. Wines, red, white, and sweet. So you can see much hasn't changed in England over this very long period. <laughs> and also in exchanges made to the court of Rome. You can see that he's not happy about that. Much like our modern-day politicians aren't happy about uh, the Treaty of Rome, indeed. To d in diverse ways. I use his spelling rather than ours. Wherefore, the remedy seems to me that each merchant bringing merchandise into England take out of the commodities of the land as much as his merchandise uh, aforesaid shall amount to, and that none carry gold or silver beyond the sea as is, as is ordained by statute. So he's arguing for a, a current account balance, and so that no gold should leave the country. It's so important that because we don't have any gold in the country, that we bring it in as a sign of our wealth. Um, and so me seems, he says, uh, with my best Blackadder voice on, that the money that is, is in England will remain 
and great quantity of money and bullion will come from the ports beyond the sea. And this is a dominant school of thought for three or four hundred years. This is the way you should run economic policy, not about inflation targeting or full employment or anything else. Just get that gold in. That's all it was, what it was about. And it's amazing how pervasive and persistent those thoughts are. I think aspects of it would sound very familiar um, to people today, if I may say so. So let me start with some definitions. I apologise um, for being so dull, but I am an economist and I am one of my species, so uh, we start with... Let's start with some stuff so we all understand what I'm talking about and then we'll look at some pretty pictures. How's that? Is that something we can uh, agree upon, plan of action? Good. So the current account... Goods and services, the uh, uh, importer or, or, or uh, export or import, and also any income receipts from overseas, so foreign aid that we give away or remittances we may receive from people overseas or remittances we give away back to people if that we're working in this country. That's the current account. Against that is the financial account. If we have a particular current account, um, let's suppose it's in deficit. In order to finance that, we have created claims that the rest of the world have on us. So the natural analogy would be your bank current account. If it's in surplus, you have a claim on the bank. If it's in deficit, the bank has a claim on you. And it's analogous in terms of the current account and the two aspects of the capital account, which is the financial account and what's called the capital account. But the two together really add up to the, the capital account. And what is concerning us today is the current account, but of course it's dual is just the capital account. So you can think of them both as, you could look at one or you could look at the other, but the two must add up to zero. And that's what we have here. Um, Left-hand side, we have the size of the UK current account on trade balance. And you can see we're in a deficit, a bad thing. We're uh, importing more than we're exporting. And some people would say, that's a bad thing. We must stop it. We must reduce imports. We mustn't trade with the rest of the world. We mustn't allow the rest of the world to have claims on us. Because having the current account deficit means that the rest of the world has claims on our assets here. What I'll argue later on, that this is a natural consequence of the domestic preferences, overseas preferences, and the world real interest rate, and shouldn't be a great cause of concern to us. So I'm giving away the punchline, but yeah, that's fine. I'm not a storyteller, I'm an economist. On the other side, we have the financial account that I've described. And uh, so, the, so the counterparty, in a sense of, of having more imports than exports, is that we're borrowing from the rest of the world, which is what that financial account is telling us. That's our, that's our loan from the rest of the world as of last year. And we have a capital account, which is some movements of, of, and transfers of wealth. But what I draw your attention to are the large net errors and emissions. When I were a lad, these were talked about as uh, capital flight, hidden tax evasion, all kinds of dodgy things that I'm sure don't go on in the UK by any means. I'm sure they have nothing to do with anything like that at all. But what I would say, of course, is that these are an unknown unknown. Look at the size of them. Uh, 22,238 million, 22 billion, as opposed to current account deficit of 84 billion. It's a quarter of the whole amount. So in a sense, we're almost saying the numbers there could be as high as 100 billion or as low as 60 billion. And we need to always remember that when we deal with numbers and statistics. They are subject to measurement error. So don't get too excited by one number and remember that, in fact, a lot of it is, is guessing, cross-checking that still leads to errors. In fact, if you add up all the current accounts in the world, there should be zero, right? I'm exporting, you're importing, it's zero. Actually, it, often, it normally shows a deficit, which implies that we are importing or exporting to the moon. So it's a kind of problem in adding up that it doesn't add to zero. So just remember that as a health warning when you come to numbers. So let's have a look at the numbers in the chart. Now that we understand, and these is, this is the current account, and the scale I've adopted is in percent of GDP. GDP is the flow of income, of goods and services produced as a whole by the economy in one year. So you can just think of it as a scalar. Let's look at, compared to the amount of production we produce, what is the deficit on current account or surplus on current account on any one year over the last 60 or so, uh, or so years? In fact, I've gone one slide too much, I apologise, let me go back um, to the original slide. And the darker line is the current account deficit. And what I'd like to draw your attention to, hopefully this works and it does, is that in the immediate post-war period, we're in surplus as much as we're in, more often than we are in deficit, but we're crossing the zero 
quite a lot. I'll come to that in a minute. But you can think of that as being associated with what used to be called stop-go cycles in the economy. Uh, economy would um, go, 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 and as it went, 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 the economy would head into a deficit, and then the brakes would be put on the economy, the economy would, try, would be engineered to slow down, and then would lead to a stop. And then after a while, it would go again. And you're seeing this kind of pattern here in the data, these kind of rapid movements in the current account. Remember as well, at this time, we're in a fixed exchange rate regime, so that if you're running a current account deficit, you're essentially losing foreign exchange reserves. So there's a limit to the extent to which you can finance a current account deficit with a fixed exchange rate regime. And then, in the early 70s, um, which, as I've said a number of times, is a good time for music, not such a great time for the economy, uh, we have uh, a large deterioration in the current account associated with two factors. The move away from a fixed exchange rate, the abandonment of Bretton Woods, allowed us not to worry about the balance of payments constraint in the way we did in the past. At the same time, you have OPEC-1 raising oil prices by a factor of two or three. Net importers at that time, that's deteriorating the current account in a persistent manner. And if you look at this carefully, of course, economists, we can look at charts and make up all kinds of stories about them. But I think what you can see is a, 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 almost a trend deterioration in the 40-year period. We haven't really got any persistent periods of, of surpluses, a, a sort of small surplus here in the early 80s when North Sea oil came on stream. Uh, but other than that, it just looks like uh, an ever deteriorating external position, which has led to many comments about this. Uh, how, how problematic is it? Remember what I said a minute ago. If we've got a current account deficit, it means the rest of the world increasingly has claims on our assets. At what point is that going to lead to a problem? It seems to a number of people. Will the rest of the world suddenly say, actually, we want London, it's ours. You've had deficits for so long, we're going to have it back. Is that really a problem, is what I want to think about today. And of course, most recently of all the current account, um, this, the dotted line is the trade in goods and services, which we understand. The rest of it is, are other income, the remittances and other forms of income uh, that I talked about earlier. And you can see a divergence. The trade on, uh, the, the deficit on trade balance and services is around 3%, but another 3% is added as remittances and other income flows have exaggerated the size of the current account deficit, leading to a number of people in the last few years being increasingly concerned about the trend in the current account. Now, these are flows per year of the amount that we're borrowing. Think, so think of it as your deficit on your current account every year. If you accumulated it over time, you'd have the level of your debt. Does that make sense? just a bunch of flows and over time. So what really matters, I'm going to argue today, is the actual debt stock, not the flows. And we'll, I'll come to explaining that in a second, if I may. Hopefully this works. It does. So this is exactly the same data, and all I'm doing is decomposing it so you can see what's driving it. And you can see in the last few years, you can see deficits on primary income account. I define what that is here. Primary income is investment income and compensation of employees. Secondary income includes redistribution of income through current transfers. Um, and they've all gone negative, particularly since the start of the financial crisis. And the current account deficit seems stuck at numbers that traditionally would have been a concern, 6% of GDP. It seems to be a, a large number and problematic. And I think with this chart, you're seeing something even clearer, it seems to me, about the trend. Certainly, of the trade balance, you've got this small period of surpluses here as North Sea oil came on stream, but really, you've got this persistent story of a deficit on trade balance almost throughout um, the last 40 years. So how much of a problem is this? That's what we want to think about today. Well, first, let's ask ourselves, um, as economists, whether the current account is related to output. Now, remember, we've talked about output in previous lectures, in the first lecture this year. We thought about output as either in an expansion period, when it's growing, or in a recessionary period, when it's not growing or negative. And we can think of adding those expansionary periods and those contractionary periods and talking about output as having a business cycle. We can think about... Uh, the economy doing well, being in expansion, or economy doing badly and being in recession. And we understand those ideas. Uh, in an expansion, it's easy to find work. 
uh, in a recession, it's difficult to find work and we might lose our house because we can't keep up the mortgages. That's the kind of um, the story of the it's a recession when your neighbour loses a job, it's a depression when you lose your job. That's the kind of story that we might have in place. So we have here um, looked at the cyclical component of GDP. So that's just the business cycle. So when it's above the line, we're kind of doing well as an economy. When it's below the line, we're in a contractionary period. And you can see this large contractionary period here uh, that we'd all recognise, starting with the financial crisis, 2007-8. And I'm simply looking at its relationship with the current account and its cyclical component. And what you can see is that they're negatively correlated. It suggests the following, that when the economy is in an expansion, the current account goes into deficit. When the economy is in a recession, the current account goes into surplus, which is almost immediately counterintuitive to the stories of mercantilism. Mercantilism says that when the economy is doing well, we're running surpluses, we're building up gold. But what actually seems to happen in an economy is that when we're doing well, we run a deficit. Now, there are two competing stories for that, one of which is the older idea of stop-go, and one is the more modern idea that relates to the lecture that I was talking about with consumption uh, and forward-looking behaviour. So let me just outline those two stories before moving on. The first story about stop-go is simply that imagine an economy in an expansion is growing towards its capacity constraint. As it goes towards its capacity constraint, if demand continues to grow, at that point, the economy sucks in goods from the rest of the world because we cannot supply them anymore domestically. So the current account deficit being associated with an expansion is indicative of an economy that's reaching its full employment level. So that idea is associated, again, to an idea we developed a couple of years ago to do with the Phillips curve. If there is a capacity level and the economy continues to grow, at that point we suck in imports from the rest of the world and we have an economy that has a current account deficit. That's the older idea. Um, similarly, if the economy uh, goes into recession and there's a large amount of excess capacity because demand is depressed, confidence is low, investment is not high, we've lost our jobs, we're not spending money, the spare capacity in the economy means that we run a surplus. We're not using up all our goods and services and we're able to then send the excess abroad. That's the older idea. The alternate idea is simply that we run deficits because our permanent income has increased. So if I imagine a world in which I have learned today that I'm going to be richer in the future, I'll say to myself, well, if we're going to be richer in the future, I'm going to consume and invest today for that richer future. And if I'm consuming and investing today, but I'm only richer in the future, the way I get those resources is to borrow them from the rest of the world. And by borrowing them from the rest of the world, I can have a higher level of consumption and investment today that's consistent with my richer future. What that means in the short run is that I run a current account deficit. But that current account deficit is financing a richer future. And therefore, I shouldn't worry about it particularly. And this was known as the intertemporal approach to the current account. A bit of a mouthful, but it uh, got a lot of citations, a lot of publication. So it's two competing theories. One of which would say that the current account deficit is problematic. It tells you about an economy that's past its capacity constraints. The other one tells you you don't need to worry about it. Current account deficit tells you that we think we're going to be richer in the future, and it should be telling us about higher growth at a future point. Kind of interesting that the same observation have theories that have quite radically impl different implications for the future. Excuse me. I've been talking almost continually since eight this morning. This is the highlight of the day, I should say. So we need a theory that helps us understand the cyclical, that's the business cycle component in uh, the current account. But you'd have noticed, because this is a Gresham lecture audience, you're very smart, that the chart I showed you of the current account seemed to show a trend. The current account was trending downwards over a long period. So my business cycle theory doesn't deal very well with a structural trend, because I've said it's a business cycle. So we might need a theory as well as over the business cycle, something that deals with the trend. So we need both if we're going to explain the current account deficit. Now let's go through some simple accounting. Um, as an, account, as a, an economist, accounting is not my strong point, but I shall do what I can on this. Um, so 
If I have output, demand side is consumed or invested. Um, what I invest requires savings. So the equilibrium in a closed economy, if we're going to have full employment, implies that the level of savings ex post equals the level of investment. What I save, somehow or other, is transferred through the financial system into equivalent level of investment that uses up all the capacity in the economy. That's the basic proposition. We've used that a number of times in these lectures, and I'm just reminding people of it here. Now, to that I can add a government. It can be a nice government, it can be a nasty government, but the government can use up resources by spending them, so they're on the top line, the government is consuming, so it's, it's rival for investment and rival for consumption. If the government's doing stuff, it's crowding out what uh, consumption and investment might otherwise happen. I don't mean it in a pejorative sense. I simply mean that the given level of output in the economy is now shared amongst three actors, consumers, investors, and the government. And on the other side, if the government is going to finance itself, let's suppose it has a, a budget balance, G equals T, um, it's, uh, the, the savings in the economy have to be allocated across taxes as well. And if we assume that the government runs a balance, then we arrive at exactly the same expression, savings equals investment. And now, let's suppose we have an open economy the rest of the world. The, what I described before was a closed economy or the world as a single economy. And now we have the possibility that as well as having output used for consumption or investment, output could be used to uh, lead to exports in the economy, net exports, exports minus imports. With the same level of savings um, problem in the economy, if I'm going to transfer the level of investment into the economy through savings, I want that to equal each other. But clearly, I can now have, because C equals C, S must equal I plus X minus M, that you have a situation whereby savings can now differ from investment in exactly the quantity of the current account, which is given by x minus m. So the current account actually reflects the net savings position of the economy. To go back to what I said a few minutes ago, just as your current account reflects your net saving position with the bank, if it's in surplus, you're a net saver. If it's in deficit, you're a net borrower. We have the same situation here. Because we're open to the rest of the world, we no longer have to have the amount of investment in the economy pinned down by the quantity of savings, we can have the amount of investment in a state where it's larger than the amount of savings, providing we then have a negative balance on the current account. So, principle, it could be a good thing. We could have more investment than the quantity of savings in the economy by running a current account deficit. The only issue is that the return on the investments should be sufficient to pay off the rate of return required from those who've lent us the money in the first place, just as with any financial transaction. If the rate of return is high enough, there's no immediate problem from running a sequence of current account deficits. And if we add in government in the same way, we have the same expression here, where savings and investment don't have to equal each other in the quantity of the current account, and if there is a current account imbalance, we can move the government position in terms of expenditure minus taxes to the left-hand side, we've now got a position where the current account deficit could be determined by either an excess in investment over savings or an excess in government expenditure over taxes, so a government deficit. And now there are two stories we might want to adopt if we want to explain the current account. We might want to think of private sector choice over investment savings, but we might also want to point the finger of blame at a government that's running persistent deficits. Actually, in this lecture, I'm not going to talk about the government anymore. I'm not going to point the finger at the government, not because I'm in Perda, but I want to concentrate on the uh, private sector problem rather than the government problem today. Uh, as a short uh, advert for my final lecture where I'll talk about policy, I'll certainly return to the question of fiscal policy and monetary policy. I think that's on the 1st of June, so do make a point coming to that. So let's take that, those bunch of uh, accounting identities into the space of a diagram where I'm certainly more comfortable. And so we have a closed economy. Uh, this, the I is the investment line. So investment demand is increasing as interest rates fall. And that's because if you increase the quantity of investment in the economy, 
the marginal project, if you stack them from the most profitable to the least profitable, the marginal project will be less profitable, and you can do it if the interest rate is lower. If the interest rate is higher, you can't do the marginal projects. So this curve is downward sloping. Clearly, the pool of savings is going the other way, because if the interest rate is higher, you're more likely to want to substitute current consumption for future consumption, because you're getting a higher rate of return. So these diagrams are drawn in this, with these slopes. And because they are, they cross at one point, which is nice for an economist, because we get an equilibrium interest rate domestically that would clear the domestic savings investment schedules that would give a full employment level for this economy. So that's our first equilibrium. No question of the current account. Now let's go and think what happens if we're a small open economy. Now economists use the idea of a small open economy because the rest of the world I don't have to model. I just take the world interest rate. The domestic clearing interest rate would be ID. That's the one I've just explained. But if I open myself up to the rest of the world and somehow or other the world interest rate is lower than the interest rate that would clear the domestic market, I now have the following schedule. At the lower interest rate, IW, I want to invest more than I did at ID. So my investment demand is now in excess of my domestic willingness to save. Interest rate is lower, so I want to save less domestically than I would have at ID. But the interest rate being lower means that I'm prepared to invest more. Immediately, by opening myself up to a world in which interest rates are lower than they ought to be domestically, I have an excess in investment over savings, and I have a current account deficit. This current account deficit, I'm just going to say here, means that instead of having this quantity of investment in the economy, you have this quantity of investment in the economy, financed by loans or claims from the rest of the world on the UK. But the higher level of investment is something we may prefer. I'm not going to get into value, but it's something that we would allow us to have a higher level of activity than we would otherwise have in the economy. And it's not necessarily a problem, providing we can pay back the claims that we're creating on our economy in the future. And that would be a question that we'd have to think about. Now, let me go on. Having done that, I'm brave enough to put this one up as well. And I know we can do it together. I know we can understand this. So I've now created a country called Foreign. And we are domestic. Um, we started here where we were a closed economy. We then said, look, let's open up to the rest of the world. And we had a lower interest rate here. And we had a current account deficit. Now, if there's only two countries in the world, the current account deficit that we have must be the same as the current account surplus foreign has. Because we're not exporting to the moon. So we add the two up, we get zero. And so why do we have the supply of savings from there available to us. Well, it, the schedules are different. At this interest rate, this particular economy has excess savings and a level of demand for investment that's lower. These, these curves are in a different space in their economy. They have different preferences, different infrastructure, different levels of development that leaves, means that these curves, when we aggregate them, are in a different space. And when, at this interest rate that leads to uh, an excess in savings. In this economy, if it were closed, interest rates would clear the market at a lower interest rate, IF1. They have opened up. There's demand for their savings. That means their interest rates are higher than they would otherwise be. Because they've opened up and provide a pool of savings, our interest rates are lower. So the world interest rate is somewhere between the point at which it would be if this country were closed and this country were closed. It's the midpoint. And at that midpoint, the foreigners, doesn't sound quite right as a word, but anyway, a foreign country has a, has a surplus and the domestic country has a deficit. And we can go further. Let us then suppose that policies are introduced in the foreign countries to encourage even more savings. Some notion about ageing, some notion about um, some inability to invest domestically leads to higher and higher savings, or maybe the discovery of, of oil 
meaning that uh, may decide to have sovereign wealth funds or some other form of savings enacted in their economies that would then lead to a further shift out in this curve. This further shift out, if this economy were closed, would lead to an even lower interest rate. But because it's open, what it does, it leads to a higher current account surplus here and even larger current account deficit here with lower world interest rates here. Again, whether this is bad for the economy depends on a, a, a number of things. We have a higher level of investment in this economy than we would otherwise if we were here. And what matters is whether these claims that we're creating on our economy are ones that we're able to pay off in the future. If they are, this isn't necessarily a problem at all, despite our deep intuition that deficits are bad. This is just a consequence of trading with the rest of the world. And if the rest of the world is saving, it's providing a pool of resources for us to use now, which, if we go back to my earlier point, is something we're happy to use because it's building a richer future, then it's not necessarily something you need to worry about. That may sound a little bit Panglossian, but I'm just, I'm just going through the story. Is that me? Sorry. Okay. Now, one um, issue with this uh, set of stories is the extent to which there is capital mobility. Now, in a famous paper in 1980, um, subsequently called the Feldstein Horioka Puzzle, um, a couple of now well known economists looked at the relationship between investment and savings at a domestic level. Now, if you looked at the previous charts, they're kind of suggesting that savings and investment don't necessarily follow each other because countries are running large current account surpluses and large current account deficits. In order for that to happen, the level of savings in an economy must be different to the level of investment. Otherwise, you wouldn't have any current account surpluses or deficits. But what they found is when they looked at the relationship between investments and savings in the economy, they saw that they moved almost one for one suggesting that the kind of story I've just outlined didn't necessarily follow, that the best way to understand a country's level of investment was to look at the domestic level of savings. There was not, in other words, according to them, a very high level of capital mobility. The story I've just outlined is what capital mobility. But Felstein Horioka says there's not a lot of capital mobility because investment and savings follow each other in an the economy. They're not disconnected in the way I've just outlined. And just to help drive home that point, Here's a chart uh, from a well-known paper. Uh, uh, Morris Obsfeld and Rogoff have both been uh, chief economists of the IMF over the years. And, and this is just plotting this, the data analogue of the regression that I've just shown. And this is looking at advanced economies. And it's looking here at savings as a fraction of output and investment as a fraction of output. And the idea is they're moving together. If they didn't move together, if they were unconnected because countries had large amounts of savings and small amounts of investment, or the other way around, we'd expect this to be a scatter. We wouldn't expect this to be positive related in the way that it is. But actually, there's a, there's a, there's a reason we see this that's still consistent with a high level of capital mobility. Imagine a shock that le raises the world level of savings in the way that I just described in the diagram. That would lower world interest rates and over time bid in higher levels of investment. So you would see savings and investment move together in aggregate. Higher savings, lower interest rates, higher levels of investment. And so that story in a world of capital mobility seems to be much more realistic than saying there's not a high level of capital mobility. And that seems to me where people are now thinking these results are coming from. And so what I want to move on to is a way from the flows, that's the actual current account in any one period, to understanding the stocks. I made the point a number of times. We've got a flow of deficits. If we add them up over time, we've got the level of debt. And it's the level of debt that ultimately acts as the constraint. You can continue to borrow again from the bank up until the bank says you cannot borrow anymore. That's what matters, the level of debt. A country. Um, that has trouble refinancing is not on the basis of a particular deficit, it's on the basis of the level of debt that it carries. And so what we want to do to understand the international position is accumulate 
the current account deficits and get a sense of what is the international investment position of a country. That is, adding up all the claims that the rest of the world have on us and all the claims that we have on the rest of the world, what does that tell us about the stock of assets and the stock of liabilities that we have and whether that will act as a constraint on our future behaviour. So we're going from the flows to the stock now. And when we think about the international investment position, it's simply the current account, that's the deficit in any period, plus any valuation changes. That's a little bit where the magic of economics comes in, if there's any magic in economics. Imagine a debt level, um, an asset level of 100% of GDP, and a, a liability level of 100% of GDP. Right? The liabilities are in sterling. Your assets are the ones you have overseas are in foreign currency. They're both at 100%. And let us suppose you run a current account deficit of 5%. So now your liabilities have gone to 105%, but your assets are still at 100%. In that same year, your assets overseas may have gone up in value if you put them in the right kind of assets. So the 100%, let's suppose you put them in some stocks that did very well in the last year, may have themselves gone to 105%. So even though you've run a current account deficit, what also matters are the valuation changes. And what, how do we get at the valuation changes? Well, it's the change in the underlying as, uh, value of the assets we hold overseas multiplied by the exchange rate. Because it's kind of helpful. If I'm holding dollar assets and sterling falls, I immediately get an increase in my overseas holding of assets. But what we'll find is the exchange rate can be very helpful in clearing current account problems. And it's come to the rescue of the UK a number of times. Notably, last year, large depreciation in the exchange rate. So we understand the current account. And we understand that what matters is the change in the international investment position. And that to understand that, we have to look at the valuation of the stock of assets and liabilities held. It's not just the flow that matters. So it might help us, actually. Unfortunately, this doesn't go through to the personal level. Our assets are all sterling denominated. We don't have a particular way of handling that. But clearly, if you have net assets, such as your house, and it's going up in value, you can trade that against any ongoing deficit. And in fact, a number of people prior to the financial crisis would be running regular deficits on their current account and clearing it by increasing uh, their mortgage through mortgage equity withdrawal. Similar kind of process, actually, to what we're talking about here. Not that I'm advising that. We'll say I'm not advising anything in this stuff. So the international uh, investment position, uh, we, can we can think about it in terms of any change in the volumes of assets and liabilities and any change in the valuation which depends upon any changes in the market prices of the assets and liabilities held times any change in the exchange rate. So there's a, kind of a few things to keep in our head, but I know we can do it. Um, um, so I'm going to just keep that as a, a definitional slide. These are available afterwards, and you can look at it there. But let me just sort of move on to look at the net investment position. This is in... Uh, millions of pounds. See, these are very large numbers, 400 billion, 200 billion. Here we have stacked the liabilities, the net liabilities, and the net assets. And you can see in the, in the sort of 20 year period from 19, almost 20 years, from 1998 to 2016, that we've tended to have net assets on foreign direct investment in the UK, um, on the UK, and liabilities uh, built up through other investments and portfolio investments in the UK. And when we look at the balance between these, we have the net investment position that has been negative over this period, apart from 2008 and 2016. I'm going to ask the audience, anybody know what happened in those two years? There weren't referendum in both years. <laughs> referenda in both years. Sorry? So, but in, and, and in both years, um, there were large depreciations in the exchange rate. And depreciation in the exchange rate, if you're holding foreign assets, increases the value of those foreign assets. Um, and that then led to the net investment position going positive, which is exactly the same 
as what happened last year with the depreciation in sterling by around 15 to 20%. So, to, so what, what looks like a problematic sequence of deficits can be cleared by a jump um, in the exchange rate. And, and so if we stack, I'm going to concentrate on total here, but PI is portfolio investment, OI is other investment, FDI, and financial derivatives and reserves. You can see that the large part of the investment position is portfolio investment, other investments, and FDI. Um, and we've taken snapshots here of 1996, 2006, and 2016. You can see that the deficit, net deficit, the net international investment position, deficit of 7% of GDP in 1996 was much the same some 10 years later. But because of the exchange rate depreciation is now positive of 24%, means that despite the fact we've been running these current account deficits, our net international investment position is not in deficit anymore. Magic of the exchange rate. But I would point to one thing, is the size of the balance sheet have increased rapidly over time. The overall balance sheet here was under twice GDP 20 years ago. 10 years ago, it was around four times GDP, and now it's between five to six times of GDP. So we have much larger gross claims abroad and gross claims on us than we had in the past. Part of that is the continuing capital mobility in the rest of the world, and part of it all also is uh, the result of lower real interest rates in the world that tended to inflate asset prices and lead to what looks like higher levels of gearing. That is, the claims that w the rest of the world have on us relative to our GDP. And also it's problematic that it may mean relatively small changes in the valuation could lead to large swings in the net international investment position. It also means that changes in the exchange rate, well, there may be more volatile changes in the exchange rate if there are some market valuation effects at home abroad that means the exchange rate has to jump so that the net international investment position isn't problematic. So these may be problems that we're storing up for the future. But right now, the external position doesn't look terribly problematic. And indeed, there's another bit of good news as well as the exchange rate, and as well as having assets denominated overseas, what we might want to look at is what is the rate of return that we have to pay foreigners on our liabilities, and what rate of return do we receive on the assets we have abroad? The blue line is the rate of return we pay overseas on an annualized basis over the last nearly 40 years, and the red line is the rate of return we've received on foreign assets. And what's been particularly useful in the last 10 years is that despite the fact we've been, in principle, running a sequence of current account deficits that have been adding um, to the overall indebtedness of the economy, we've been getting a rate of return of around 2%, and yet foreigners have been getting a rate of return from us of just over zero. So it's been good business. You can run more debt if you're paying less on it than the claims that are made against us. Um, there are all kinds of reasons for that. That could be to do with the relatively relative safety of UK assets as opposed to the ones we're investing in. But this persistent excess return has been useful in terms of being able to finance a current account deficit which is more larger than you would be able to were you paying in excess yourself for the borrowing that you have. So um, what you can do is that you can apply that um, return on liabilities and assets to the stock of liabilities and the stock of, of uh, uh, assets. And that will give you an outflow and an inflow in, 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 into the economy. And so what you can see in the past, some 10 years ago, is that the rate of return times the stock of liabilities and assets gave you a negative return. And what we've had on those particular returns is a net positive flow, against which what we've had is a, um, an increase in negative remittances uh, from workers that has offset that. So this, this positive um, flow is, is been helpful in terms of financing our uh, current account deficit over this period. And now I want to illustrate as well the advantages we have from uh, movements in the exchange rate. You can see that this is the real exchange rate, but you can see that 
This is just simply plotting the relationship between the real exchange rate and the net international uh, investment position. And you can see the negative relationship um, and that there are movements here, here and here, um, in the exchange rate down that, and here with the exchange rate. So you can hear in the mid-90s this large appreciation associated with a, a long persistent fall in the net investment position. But this depreciation here helped the net investment position at a time that the economy was hampered. And again, we've seen a fall in the exchange rate help the net investment position here. So, so one of the things that helps us adjust when the net investment position becomes problematic is the jump in the exchange rate. That's what we're, I'm showing by this line here. And so, because of the exchange rate and because of the change in the valuation of assets and liabilities, the accumulated current account deficit, I'm just adding up the deficits over time. Remember I said some moments ago, if you accumulate the deficits, you're going to end up with the level of debt. It doesn't stack up at all. If it did, this blue line would be the same as the red line, but it's not. That's because these other effects are offsetting these accumulated current account deficits, which suggests that the structural current account deficit isn't as much of a problem as it would appear if you just look at the numbers. Now, I want to go on to make some points, and then we'll wind up in five minutes or so, about how the exchange rate can further help you adjust in an economy. And here we'll go back to some old ideas from the 1950s, a couple of Australian economists, Salter and Swan, and we'll try to understand how the exchange rate might help an economy adjust in the way that I've just described. If the, if the exchange rate is jumping to help the net investment position, how exactly is that helping us? And I just want to go through an argument that I think will follow. Now, here we have the level of absorption or expenditure in the economy, how much activity there is in the economy. And here we have the exchange rate, where this is an appreciation of the exchange rate. And so internal balance, we could think of that as full employment in the economy. If we have higher levels of domestic absorption, we want to signal to people to send their resources domestically. And the way we do that is have a higher exchange rate. If the exchange rate is higher, we're going to keep our resources domestically rather than send them to the traded sector. For, so for internal balance, the higher level of absorption requires a higher exchange rate. If the exchange rate doesn't rise enough, we'll have an inflation. If it rises by too much, we'll have an unemployment. So this is the line we want to be on. If we're not on it, the exchange rate isn't high enough, we'll have an inflation. And if it's too high, we'll have unemployment. So that's one set of lines. There we go. Um, and secondly, we want external balance. And external balance is very much what we're talking about here. A level of in international investment position that doesn't threaten the financial sustainability of the economy. And here we have domestic absorption, says that if we're going to have more activity in the economy, what we need is a depreciated exchange rate so that goods are switched to the external sector. By switching the goods to the external sector, we're not going to run too much of a current account deficit. If the exchange rate is too high, we'll run a current account deficit. If it's too low, we'll run a current account surplus. If the exchange rate is just right, we'll be on the current, we'll be on an external balance. And now we can put the two together. Again, we have a positive slope and a negative slope. And if we want the economy to be in good shape, we want it to be somewhere around here with a certain level of domestic absorption and exchange rate given by here. And so, compared to this point, if the exchange rate is too high, the economy could have unemployment and a current account deficit. If the exchange rate is too low, we can have inflation and a current account surplus. And again, given to this point here, if the exchange rate was fixed and the level of domestic absorption was too high, we would have inflation and a current account deficit. And again, compared to this point here, if the exchange rate was fixed and absorption or expenditure was too low, we would have unemployment and a current account surplus. Now, in the period leading up to last year, we might have thought that the UK economy 
was one that was characterised by unemployment or underemployment or spare capacity. You use your phrase as you wish. And that the economy also had a significant current account deficit. And therefore, we might have thought that the exchange rate was overvalued before the jump last year. And so the jump last year may have helped us get to a point that was um, to do with inflation and a current account surplus. And lots of people may argue that inflation is a good thing for the economy because we're carrying a lot of household debt and that would reduce the value of the debt. And so the, the jump in the exchange rate may well have been exactly what the economy required. So it would have got rid of the current account deficit and created a helpful inflation. As ever in economics, it's never as simple as that. And what might have happened is that if we've decoupled from a major trading partner, these curves themselves might have shifted in a particular way to say that the equilibrium exchange rate was now lower than it was in the past, uh, meaning that the exchange rate was simply jumping to some point that didn't help us get to any equilibrium. We don't know the answer yet. I'm just suggesting there's two possible stories. One is that the jump in the exchange rate was helpful, and one was that it kind of helps us adjust a little bit but doesn't change the ultimate structural position, which is that we're going to need a lower exchange rate to deal with the fact that we're breaking up trading relations with the European Union. So we've been through a lot uh, today, but I hope I've managed to uh, keep you all with me uh, in this lecture. The old debate was whether domestic absorption demand caused the current account or whether it was capital coming in from abroad that caused the current account by allowing us to borrow more than we might have wanted to. Um, the point I'm trying to say here to everyone is that the way that we ha the current account has developed is directly a result of our own preferences for saving domestically, our own investment curve, the pool of savings from the rest of the world and the, the demand from the rest of the world for those savings. These equalize at some world real interest rate that leads to us making a domestic choice about wanting to invest more than we save. This led to a structural current account deficit, which would be problematic if it was storing up claims from the rest of the world on us that we, we can't finance. It doesn't look at the moment that they're terribly problematic. In fact, the net investment position is positive. It may not stay positive forever. The exchange rate may, may appreciate again, um, and the rate of return may change, leading to all kinds of problems. But this sequence of current account deficits by itself is not a problem because it seems to be as much a result of private sector choice and the availability of capital for the UK that still seems to be available to us. And it doesn't look as though we're having to pay any kind of excess premium vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world for that borrowing. Remember, the interest rate we're paying on our liabilities is far below what we receive for assets that we're investing in the rest of the world. <coughs> There are still things to worry about, <coughs> and that is to, excuse me, <coughs> sharp movements in the available supply of capital in the rest of the world may move the real interest rate. We have to fund all kinds of infrastructure in the economy to do with an aging population. And also, if, if we're requiring the exchange rate to jump every once in a while to clear our net investment position, that may also be problematic as we try to develop a traded sector vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world if the exchange rate is not something that's terribly predictable. So there are problems ahead, but they're not necessarily caused directly by structural current account deficit. Thank you very much.